Hi, and welcome to Take Every Thought Captive, our weekly look at the Catholic intellectual tradition and an exploration of the author's books and topics that have shaped Catholic thinking for 2,000 years. My name is Jason Gale, and I'm joined this week by Dr. Richard Buzzichelli, our lecturer in theology here at Catholic Studies Academy. And before we get started, I want to invite all our listeners, please hit that thumbs up button, please hit that like button, whatever buttons are down there uh, uh, that help share and uh, put this content in front of other people, hit those buttons. Um, we are one of our goals here at Catholic Studies Academy, especially this year, is try to grow our community outside of our formal classes um, that we that we have over at our website. So, if you want to take uh, systematic classes in theology and philosophy, we have those over there. Um, and then, in the meantime, we also want to grow our community that's just interested in thinking deeply about current situations and really trying to apply solid theological and philosophical principles to be able to kind of navigate the the minefield that we live in. Uh, today. And uh, today our topic is going to be one such minefield, uh, and that is uh, going to be the topic of uh, relation-based youth ministry and the problem of uh, teenagers, uh, adolescents, um, you know, many times by the time they get to youth group, by the time they get to this point of uh, uh, receiving the sacrament of confirmation or something, or, or something similar, if it's later on, um, uh, when they're getting to that point that they already don't believe. Um, and so uh, we're going to talk today uh, particularly about this issue um, of that. And, and you can look online um, at all of the different studies that have been done with regards to um, why people leave the church. Uh, and especially there's a lot of good things um, that are out there with uh, uh, specific regard to uh, adolescents. Uh, Christian Smith has done a... Um, a lot of good studies uh, about uh, youth ministry and um, therapeutic moral deism, uh, uh, which is a, a, a great, a great description of, of kind of characterizing the, the belief of, of uh, teenagers and stuff. Um, and so both Dr. Booz Kelly and I have worked with um, uh, youth in this area. And so we're going to kind of dive into it. So Maybe Dr. Bruce Kelly, maybe you can set up uh, uh, set up the issue uh, for us and the the challenge for us as as Catholics. Uh, what what is the issue and the challenge at hand? Okay, so it seems to me right that uh, in comparison to the voice of the Church, to mm -hmm. the voice of the Bible, right, to the voice of the constant teaching and tradition of the Church, the voice of the world is is pretty clear and pretty loud. And yeah, very loud. They've been, they've been exposed to it. They've been hearing that voice through various forms of media, really from the time they were in the cradle. Uh, they it it's mostly what they get when they go to school. It's mm -hmm. and for this reason, you know, many people have for a long time chosen to homeschool. But but even sure. uh, even homeschooling doesn't completely shut that out, right? It's on television. It's it's sure. on the computer. Uh, it's it's everywhere that you look, right? It's on the newsstands as you as you're in the supermarket. It's 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 in the advertisements, right? In the supermarket or in the shopping mall. It's, yeah. It's on billboards. It's everywhere that you go. Everything is the world's point of view. Uh, and the world's point of view is not the view of uh, is not the view of revelation, right? right. So. Um, so basically, you've got these two competing messages. One of them is very, very loud, and the other is comparatively soft-spoken. Um, and that's actually that's an issue that traces all the way back to the Bible. If you notice in the garden mm -hmm. narrative, right, um, the serpent speaks with words. He's he's pretty locutious, right, yeah. uh, or loquacious, I should say. He's pretty loquacious, but um, but by contrast, the tree of the the tree of life, right, has no has no vocal advocate. You only hear from God, like yeah, that's it. that's interesting. He just says, you know, don't eat from the other tree. It's good. That's it. Um, but but he's not like hanging out in the tree saying, eat from this tree, um, don't eat from the other one. But the serpent is speaking, right? And that that's basically yeah. that's basically a, a problem that we um, that we have uh, in the world. Now, uh, I want to 
I want to point out that um, that what it comes down to, right, ultimately is that if the starting point is that you've got this vocal world and this comparatively quiet church, right, um, mm -hmm. th there are other problems that come along with that. One is the confused voice in the church, where sometimes there's sometimes the message from the pulpit is not clear. Right now, there's the conversation about Eucharistic yeah. incoherence, uh, where what we say we believe about the Eucharist and the way that we actually, um, the way that we actually treat it, right, in terms of, in terms of giving communion to people who obviously contradict everything we say um, about faith and morals, right? Yeah. Um, that this creates a scandal against the faith, right? That's an argument that people have been making mm -hmm. for quite a long time now. And yet the problem persists. So, um, so that's one thing, right, among many others that we could point to, plus, you know, the personal behavior of various people entrusted with authority. So in my experience, right, what, what happens is there's you're already starting from, as you mentioned earlier, you're already starting from basically a, a place of a place of at least unconscious disbelief. If you could get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. It's at least unconscious disbelief. It may not be clearly formed where the person's very, you know, I, yes, in right. fact, I, I thought about these things and I don't believe them. But instead, a posture that, a posture that just doesn't, it's not characterized by complete buy-in, right, of the message. It's characterized, yeah. it's, you, the person's mind is formed more by the world than by the gospel. And, um, and so it, from this starting point, right, there's the need to demonstrate the truth of the faith. There's the need mm -hmm. to make it seem believable because, in fact, uh, it's not. And the, the only way to do that from the point of view of the youth is essentially to, um, to, to establish trust. But they have to believe the messenger before they'll believe the message. Yeah, well, I think that I think that's one of the things that's um, that happens a lot um, is even when you do have um, good catechesis, um, you know, solid formation, things like that, and you see incremental growth in the youth. Many times, it, it quickly it quickly gets lost or um, just flat out squashed when because you know kids know when when there's bs uh -huh. kids know when there's uh you know uh in there's inauthenticity right so, um you know so uh so i think many times when even when it, even when it is preached well right they'll say okay i believe what you're saying but 90 percent of the people I see that also claim to be Catholic are not living that way. Mm -hmm. So that hypocrisy, I think, uh, speaks just um, as loud as probably, <laughs> you know, and it matches, you know, the, the hypocrisy, the message of the hypocrisy matches more of the world's message than what our message um, uh, has to do with reality, if that makes sense. I mean, because when we catechize, we're not just catechizing about the things we believe, but we believe them because they have to do with reality, right? Uh -huh. But the 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 hypocrisy that the world sees in the church fits the reality that they see more than the truth about what is actually real and unseen, right? So that's, I mean, I think that's one of the the, the huge issues is this. Um, like you said, this, this idea of trust, right? Um, one thing, one thing I do want to bring up is, you know, is, so, you know, in order to trust, there has to be that relationship there between um, the, 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 the teacher or, you know, we'll just say the teacher for now, I'll just kind of use that as kind of a general term. You know, there has to be that relationship between the teacher and the student. Um, is that still possible though? That's what I'm wondering with regards to yeah. establishing this trust, you know, because um, we, we've, and we've talked about this before. Yeah. Like the, 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 
uh, with all of the, the, the sex abuse and all of that has created an environment of distrust uh, and, you know, obvious, I would say, you know, rightly so. Um, but it, but how are we supposed to build these relationships that are built on trust, right? Mm-hmm. But from the foundation of them, there's this, there's an element of distrust. There always has to be a, a third person in the room. We have to be in view of the cameras. We always have to have um, the door open. We can't talk about this without somebody else present. We can't, you know, um, even like, you know, I can't even give you a hug. I can't um, yeah. uh, uh, accept any gifts. I mean, there's just so many different things that that just feed mistrust or set a foundation of, of, of untrust, right? But yet this is what, you know, the the... The kids, this is what the adolescent needs to to help establish a foundation of faith within them. Yeah. So, you know, I, I what one is tempted to do when faced with a question like this is, is to offer numerous, you know, techniques for compensating for the problem. And, and I can't do that. I, I don't right. think this is a yeah, I don't think this is the kind of thing that um, you know, where there's sort of like a a pedagogical solution to it exactly right um yeah. right a technical solution I, I just don't i don't think that that's the case i um i think that the what you're talking about yeah which has been a problem now for you know the better part of the last 20 years or so right um mm-hmm. is um is a serious impediment to establishing the trust necessary to mm-hmm. Uh, to, to sort of evangelize the youth. Right. Um, it traces back, right? I, I remember when this was, was first sort of introduced, right? It was when the, when the scandals first broke in the early 2000s, right? Of course, the uh, institutional self-protectionist reaction was to sort of not name any names, not not really recognize um, the nature and structure of the problem, but just sort of to speak in generalities that there had been abuse of minors, you know? Uh, And, and so Mm -hmm. to sort of treat everyone uh, in the church exactly the same way, much as, you know, after nine 11, uh, you're, you know, you're, I'm sorry. Dr. Bruce Kelly, can, can you, can you repeat that? Sorry. Can you repeat that, that the internet cut out? Yeah. So where, where, where did you leave? Where'd you lose uh, uh, the connection? Right. When you said that um, uh, 20, 20 years ago. Oh, okay. So, so uh, tracing back about 20 years, the start of the two right? thousands. Yeah. to so the early two thousands when yeah. the scandals first broke, um, there was sort of an institutional, a typical sort of institutional response, right? Self-protectionist mm-hmm. where, rather than sort of, you know, um, throwing everything into the light and naming names and naming exactly, you know, what the, what the nature and structure of the problem was. Mm -hmm. The church spoke in generalities, you know, that people had been abused, minors had been abused, and we were going to treat everyone in the church the same way as a result, right? Much like after 9-11, um, we decided that your grand, your, you know, your 80-year-old grandmother in a wheelchair uh, has, to be, has to be searched with a metal detector and all this um, yeah. before she gets on a plane, right? Because, of course, uh, anyone could be a um, perpetrator. Well, the, I remember the um, seminars, right, at the time. That were going on, and I remember the complaints coming from the laity uh, when they recognized that the problem they were talking about was overwhelmingly right, not a problem stemming from the laity, mm-hmm. but from uh, but from a certain segment of the clergy, right? Sure. Um, and um, and so they resented being subjected to all of this, but nonetheless. Uh, that's what the church has been doing now for a long time. And probably, probably, right, it's, um, it's had some positive effect. Uh, and, you know, there have been policing efforts, right, and even among the clergy, and they've had some 
positive effect, right? Mm-hmm. However, right? However, um, the the damage, right? I mean, the the um, how can I put it? The instrument, yeah. right? That was used to sort of um, correct the problem is a pretty blunt instrument, and and ultimately, it tends to undermine the very means by which people forge and express relationships of trust. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about parents, a parent who, who never hugs his child or pats him on the head or puts him on his oh, knee. Yeah. Right? I mean, that what kind of a relationship is that? It's hard to, it's hard to say, right? And traditionally, relationships, close relationships between parents and children have, have always kind of looked that way. If you tune in, for example, to an old episode of, uh, I don't know, um, leave it to beaver or, uh, (laughs) or I don't know, you know, one of those, one of those, one of those shows from way back when, right. Um, Before any of this stuff happened, parents like adults, whether they were the parent of the child or not would, would, you know, hold the child's hands, you know, and talk to him and would um, would hug the child and sit the child on yeah. their knee, right? That, that's like normal human behavior, actually. Um, and, and so when, when that kind of thing is no longer permitted, <laughs> it's, um, it, creates a, it creates a barrier to forming relationships. But I don't think, in spite of all that, I don't think that it's impossible right. to bridge the gap. I just think it's now made very, very difficult and, and the result of that difficulty is that a lot of people aren't reached. Right. Right. And I think, you know, I, I you know, I think you're right that, you know, for the youth, there, there has to be this trust, or, or I think for the majority of youth, um, because of the secular um, culture that just simply, you know, treats everything with skepticism that comes from the church or from wherever, right. That there, that it's this, um, you begin with skepticism. That's, that's the beginning point. So um, I, I think for, for, for a lot of youth, right. The, the, even if you have the best message, it's still going to be met with uh, skepticism as opposed to, to trust. So there has to be mm-hmm. this trusting of the, the, the someone, the trusting of the teacher um, beforehand. And I think this is what the church, you know, does mean when she, you know, right now they're, they're, you know, they're talking about accompaniment. Yeah. Um, and right. I think that's what they mean is like, you know, um, it's not, you know, that it's to me, it's, you know, almost like, okay, you're just going to have to, you know, um, you know, I hate to use the phrase walk with them, but I mean like, yeah, like, but I mean that like in the, 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 or like the, the early form of like the pedagogue right like who yeah, walked right. with the child and you know the the pedagogue mm-hmm. was an actual person that walked with the child in the place of the parent mm-hmm. when the parent was away and would keep the child from sinning and would would point out dangers and 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 benefits in in the the environment that they were in um you know didn't necessarily take the place of a parent but walked instead you know with with them in that way so I mean, walking with them like that, being a teacher as mm-hmm. they experience life, you know, like, yeah. you know, and I think and I think one of the things that you brought up um, that I think we have to do is um, uh, really try to reach them with, you know, um, reality, you know, help form them in, in, in because the secular view of reality is not uh, uh, the is not reality. Right. Um how do you how do you think we how do you think we go about doing that or what do you what do you think about um kind of uh fighting that secular view of reality where yeah okay you know, so uh, your feelings are everything and yeah. you know yada 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 relativism all that stuff i think you have to you have to look for the you have to look for when the um when the narrative fails right which happens yeah. fairly frequently now you know i i um I have some experience with this, right? I, I, um, I, I teach young people and, and, and I know that I've had some degree of success, right? I know that there mm-hmm. are people who, 
in the course of my whole career, which I've taught, you know, in college and also high school students, um, I, I, I know that there are people who came to faith, at least mm -hmm. in connection with their exposure uh, to me as a, as a teacher and a mentor. I know that there are people whose faith grew in connection with that exposure. I know that there are people who, um, who passed through a period of doubt and made it through to the other side yeah. in connection to their relationship with me, right? Um, so I guess I'm probably doing something right here. I think I, I've got some kind of insight about how this works. Um, I tend not to really think about it systematically most of the time. So this is sort of an interesting discussion for me. Yeah. You know, I'm not like, I'm not a sort of in education as a discipline. And so I don't really, you know, think sure. about um, pedagogy systematically. Exactly. I just sort of do it. Uh, but, and there's, there, th that's a whole nother conversation, by the way. Is, yeah. You yeah. Know, sometimes I think we do talk too much about it. Right. Yeah. So, but let me tell you what I, what I think I observe in my own interactions. Right. Sure. Um, so the, you know, the devil is a liar and, and when you string enough lies together, it's hard for them to hold together. Mm -hmm. Right. They tend to sort of unravel. They show their, they show their incoherences after a while. And I think that um, the fact, the fact is that the world's message is not, ultimately satisfying mm -hmm. and in spite of everything that people think they're supposed to they're supposed to be certain about there are all kinds of opportunities that arise in daily life to point out that that isn't so mm -hmm. why for example are you so unhappy today when uh you think right that you're sort of embracing what everybody says is the wise thing well, yeah. why do you still find yourself um stricken right with this sort of this emptiness or grief what's this angst about mm -hmm. where's that coming from and it gives you an opportunity to point out the the false the falseness of the message of the world yeah. and to give the student, right, a, a different perspective on the problem. Maybe you have a different answer than the one the world gives, right? That they might, they might want to give some thought to. And they look at you and they think, they think, um, well, I mean, this guy seems to be getting up in the morning, day to day. Uh, he's pretty stable, right? So I, I've had I've had students say a couple of things to me over the years that I, I think gives me a window into how this works, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of them said to me at one point, um, you seem like you're the most, you're, you're the only stable adult I've ever had in my life. Dear and God, that's, that's insane. That's, no, no offense. I'm not, I'm not saying yeah, that. I mean, like that's, but that's crazy. Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. Right. But so, okay. So you're surrounded by adults who aren't stable. The adults in your life, the people you're close to aren't stable. They. All right. So, so, so the obvious question is what makes this one stable? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And yeah, like, yeah. And, and are there something, you know, I think even there's, you know, I think for the, for the person who's striving for holiness, there is a piece about them, right. That's, uh -huh. that's maddening uh, to the anxious secularist, right. Um, that it's, it's, it's upsetting. There's, it, it bothers, it bothers me that, that you are who you are and you're peaceful about it. You don't buy into the narrative. Yeah. And you seem to be happier than the people who do. Now, here's one of the things, here's one of the things about, uh, about me personally, right. Mm -hmm. As a teacher that I think, um, I think is helpful. 
Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting this is not a technique that you can learn. It's just sure. who I am. Um, I, I tend to be pretty transparent with my students. That mm-hmm. doesn't mean that I tell them everything about myself. Yeah. But it means that I, if, if I, if I find uh, something troubling, if I, if I see a problem, right? If I really recognize a struggle, um, I'll tell them that. Like, I'll be honest about that with them. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's, I know that's hard, isn't it? Yeah. But- and, and that's a fine line because I think, you know, I've seen, I've seen this with, with youth ministers is they, they, they almost go to the point of being immodest in their speech with regards to how much they divulge about their, their inner life. Yeah. You got to um, be careful and, about and, and, and yeah. And so many times it's, it's about that um, as opposed to helping the student, you know, if I see, yeah, I mean, if I see an issue with something or like you said, you see an issue with, uh, with something or somebody struggling with something or somebody brings up a particular topic. Yeah. You, 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 you acknowledge it. You don't brush it aside, but you also don't, um, turn it back on, on yourself. You know, there's a, there's kind of a, um, a particular focus there where we want to keep it, uh, uh, particularly on them, but, you know, here's how I see it. Um, yeah. So, you know, I had, um, uh, I've had students from time to time, you know, come to me and express struggles with same-sex attraction, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and at various stages, right, where some of them were like, uh, I don't see what's wrong with it, and some were like, uh, I do see what's, ro- I, I see it as wrong. I don't know what to do about it. Yeah, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, but but one of the things that I think um, they've they've sort of expressed appreciation for right is is that i sort of stay on topic when it comes to this kind of thing right yeah that's key Uh, namely i'll say i I remember one time to me i was just talking about i was just responding to a question i wasn't but this meant a lot to the student in question um where i i basically said something like well, um, I don't know exactly what that's like uh, because it's not something that I've experienced. Uh, but I then went on to say I have other experiences, right, that may be analogous. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it just meant a lot to the student for me to sort of to basically not talk outside of my expertise as far as experience goes right i I, yeah in fact i don't have that experience i have other experiences it's not that i don't have any experience with struggles with temptations with sins but i don't have that one and um and and that it means a lot to just to just show where the this is what i'm talking about right i'm not i'm not going to speak to somebody else's experience i don't i don't have yeah and, and I think that again, like with the, with the, the, the fine line between um, being personable, being open and transparent while not being immodest, you know, there's, there is, there is also the balance between um, discussing somebody's subjective experiences and the objective reality of the issue at hand. Right. Yeah. Uh, we could talk all day about the objective reality of the issue at hand but when it with regards to somebody's subjective experience how do you how do you process that like and i think that's what um you know one of the um one of the things in one of the 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 Kara reports um which i think really hits on this um and, and I'll, pu- I'll i'll put this down in the show notes but one of the things in like the summary of this this particular one i was reading it said an accumulation of unresolved discrepancies ultimately led to the conclusion that quote, none of it makes sense or quote, I just don't buy it anymore. So why stay? Um, you know, and I think that's, I think that's the, one of the particular issues that, that, that you're bringing up here is that, 
um, they may even know the objective reality of the thing at hand, whether it be, you know, the church's position on same sex attraction, homosexual acts, things like that. But also, but at the same time, the subjective experiences, and they're trying to square these circles or they're trying to uh, process it and they just need somebody to help them uh, process it. Cause I think many times they fall into either denying the objective reality or, you know, in order to satisfy their subjective feelings or repressing subjective feelings uh, because of the objective reality, as opposed to trying to say, how can, how can I, how can I look through this with the, with an authentic uh, Christological lens or, or yeah. with an authentic Catholic lens? They need somebody, they need, you know, um, the St. Philip. How can I understand these things unless yeah. somebody teaches me, right? They need that, that person to, to be able to bring together those objective and subjective realities, right? Um, but this is where this is where some degree of transparency is good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and because if they see that you also struggle, right, that you have your own subjective experiences, mm -hmm. and yet you believe, right, yeah. and yet you persevere, um, then then it raises a question, right? It forces a question. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? How does one yeah. do that, right? Um, how does it make sense to do that? Yeah. And, and it, it, it opens, I mean, this, this is, uh, if accompaniment means anything, I, I guess this is what it means, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so they, like you're being honest with them about your own, your own place, right? And yeah. they're like, okay, I can trust an honest person. So I'll hear him out. Maybe he's got some insight. Maybe he's got some wisdom. And what they, if they stick around, right, what they might learn is that, is that subjective experiences, it's not that they're not real, but that they have a certain relationship to objective reality. Mm -hmm. And, and that, and that we can, there is such a thing as an affective error. Right. Right. And this is something that our world doesn't, the world doesn't really want us to accept. Um, although tacitly, I mean, they do, they do think that, right. When they talk about homophobia, they're, yeah. they're talk, they're saying that you're making an affective error, right. That you have a certain feeling about same sex attraction um, that is not valid. That's their position. Uh, but, and that's what I'm talking about actually, right? I, when I talk about an affective, when I'm talking about an affective error, it's not that you're not valid. Yeah. It's that, it's that the subjective experience here is the kind of mistake and it's a mistake. And we all have these, this happens sure. to everyone. This is what being tempted is all about, right? I want something that in fact is not good. Yeah. There's a, I am subjectively attracted to an the, improper object yeah there's a desire there that's not good and healthy right yeah. that it lies in the it lies in the will how do we yeah how do we combat it how do we yeah fight fight against it but yeah and i think even just even just you know kind of like this like just many adolescents just need help because either because the the world says you know either either they're completely affirmed in their feelings or they're told your, your feelings are completely wrong on this subject. And you, you, not only do you need to think this, but you need to go through such a conversion or transformation that we need to, you need to get your feelings in line with my ideology. Right. I mean, it, it is literally, I think more, <laughs> uh, more in lines with, you know, conversion with, with how some of these, how, you know, yeah. kind of this secular worldview gets kind of put on our kids. Right. Yeah, um, right. and and I think and, and again I think many of them have trouble um, processing that right uh, of saying well you know I really don't think that you know homosexual acts are good but I I have I have I have nothing to to support that I have yeah, nothing so to have nothing, no way to process it yeah they, so they have nothing to support uh, the position right and yeah. um, and this goes to that sort of uh, what was the phrase you used. 
in the study? The uh, uh, with the discrepancies. Yeah, an accumulation of unresolved discrepancies, right? right. It ultimately led to them just saying to, to, to hell with it. I'm, I'm out of here. Right. Right. So nobody's got an explanation as to why right. the church uh, holds a heteronormative view of human sexuality. And, right? they, and they have that experience over and over and over with, you know, yeah, so, so by eighth grade, maybe in high school, definitely by college, they're out. So the world says this is great. Right. And the church says, no, it's not. But the world says it very loudly. The church says it very quietly. Yeah. Right. And um, and the world paints these pictures. Right. Mm -hmm. Of happy and morally noble. Right. The most heroic person in the movie is 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 the the person in the same sex relationship. Yeah. Um, Right. And and so that part of the message sounds coherent precisely because you haven't really advanced a reason why you hold the alternative view, right? I mean, like, why should you have an objection to what, to these, to this relationship? Yeah. It seems right from all the pictures that I'm given that this is, this is just as potentially happy and fulfilling as any heterosexual relationship. Meanwhile, sure. I see my parents bickering around the kitchen table. Right. I see, you know, people getting divorced and I see people cheating on each other. So, so there are all these sort of discrepancies on the side of the church's view, whereas the world sort of, it, it's not that there aren't discrepancies there. It's just that there's a concerted effort to paint uh, a picture, right? Yeah. Uh, sort of propagandistic uh picture that makes yeah it- there's a fa- facade there that doesn't match reality right at all so um so that's a that's a major that's a major problem um what do we do about it well there's nothing that we can do at this stage in my view to like we can't just own we can't suddenly own all the means of communication all the all the levers of culture we can right we can try to build alternative structures and gradually sort of um you know there's this discussion today about parallel uh parallel media and this kind of thing right sure that, that's a long-term goal right that's yeah. a long goal but in the meantime what do you do you don't have those levers so um so again i think it comes back to relationships they really have to see this oddball of a figure, uh, mm-hmm. the faithful Catholic, mm-hmm. as someone who, as someone who actually isn't insane. Yeah, like you, you have to defy. You have to be right. The falsification of the message of the world. You have to be that. The, the, I, you almost want to say like the, the quasi incarnation of the the, the and you know uh, of the culture right or, or of the anti culture right that's right that's right you have I mean this is a now when I think about it this way I, I hadn't really put it in in these terms in my own mind before but now that I do it it seems a correct and b um kind of scary it's a high bar right yeah you have to manifest you have to be a an actual instantiation in human form right Mm -hmm. um of you have to be the counter evidence against the message of the world yeah i i think one of the one of the key things that goes with that that um that is that is starting to become anti uh, 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 totally against the culture is um, the the act of for again for the teacher uh, or the mentor right the act of asking a question to the to the student because it first I think it's completely anti cultural because the world just tells you what to believe it doesn't ask you anything it simply tells uh-huh. you so to to so to ask a question right and especially to ask a ask a question in person 
to look somebody in the eyes and ask them a question. It's, it's, it's a very vulnerable place to be in, which makes, I think, a lot of youth uncomfortable, which may make them flee, right? Uh, we have to be, you know, we, we can't be aggressive in it. But I think one of the things that, that, that we can do by asking them a question is it, it shows that you actually care about them. You're not trying to, um, um, you're not trying to tell them, right? You're not just going to be the, the voice of opposition, which you need to be. Um, but at the same time, if you ask, I think, a, a student a question like that, it also shows, you, I mean, it shows that you care about them. You care what they think. Nobody's mm -hmm. ever asked me a question before. What, a, what do I think or how do I process what the world is telling me? Right. So, so I, I think it shows uh, care uh, and, you know, uh, small forms of love, right. To ask them a question, how are you doing? You know, this is coming up, you know, this is in the news. What do you think about that? Um, you know, to, to, and then, you know, I think that does build, build that trust is when you do ask them questions. But I think also one of the other things that, that questioning does is that it does stir within them, uh, curiosity, right. Um, and this is, you know, one of the one of the particular things with like some of the old catechisms, right? Um, it was question and answer because, um, you know, it, it's we have to, you know, if I give you a question, if I ask you a question, your first the first thing that pop into your mind was, might be, wow, I would have never thought of this question had he not asked it, uh -huh. right? And if we ask those very important questions to our students. It stirs up within them, I, I think, genuine spiritual curiosity, right? Where they can begin to say, like, I trust this guy. He's challenging me in a way that the that the world is not. Uh, I'm thinking about things differently. Maybe he maybe he has an answer to to some of these things. Whether that be again, and this is where you know you get into why you you know why it's important to know your students, right? Is this the subjective and objective dimensions within uh, uh kind of the 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 uh the minefield that is the 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 adolescent soul yeah. right so now there there are um you know there there are how can i put this um there will be those kids you're not going to reach sure right and and i think one of the reasons you won't reach them is because they they themselves don't really they're they're already quite hardened right yeah I know that sounds really terrible to say, you know, because like children are all lovable and great, but, but I think some of these kids are already really pretty hardened and closed off and maybe with a lot of work over a long period of time, which, mm -hmm. which you don't have because you won't have them in front of you that long. Right. Sure. But if there are enough of us one yeah. after the other year after year, maybe we can begin to soften that. But, but in the meantime, right now, today, you're not going to be able to reach that kid. But I think that, um, and you'll you'll see this you'll see this sort of when a, when a kid would say, um, you know that he he's a know it all or like he, you know it's he's right and you're wrong right yeah that that's their that's the way they look at you but you know full well that there are plenty that there are other kids in the class right who who don't see you that way that's not what they encounter. Um, so it's not you, right? It's, it's them. Now, here's what I, here's what I think is really important in terms of one of the, one of the things of establishing this trust is how do I get to ask a kid a question mm -hmm. a real, and really have that question taken seriously? Yeah. How do I allow, how do I get the student to allow me to do that? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing is I have to allow the student to do it. Mm. Right. So I, I might be able to pose kind of abstract questions, but but to get to the point where I can pose a question that really challenges the worldview mm -hmm. that cuts to the very foundations of it. Right. Um, you know, that sort of digs into its premises. Yeah. That that takes more trust. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to get there, I have to let the student ask me questions too right and like honestly answer them take them seriously right yeah so um i think there are things you don't need to do i think you don't need to 
accept gotcha questions, right? I think you don't need to accept questions that are supposed to, that are designed um, more as statements than as, like they're not actually seeking knowledge, right? They're, right, right, right. They're framed in the form of a question, but they're really just, they're rhetorical questions. I don't think you need to accept rhetorical questions. Um, I think um, I think you don't need to accept questions that are are sort of inherently disrespectful. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, but um, but I but I think you need to accept genuine questions. If the question's coming to you and it's like, I, I can tell that's a real question. Yeah, yeah. You can right? tell. Yeah, that, can that's tell. a then it deserves a real answer. Yeah. And sometimes your answer is, I don't know. Now, if you really, if you're really, um, if you're really well prepared though, because there are things we don't know, right? There are, sure. there are questions we cannot at this point answer, but I think you should at least be able, and this is maybe truer in a college environment, say than a high school environment, right? But I think you should be able to explain why you can't answer the question and yeah. what you would have to know first in order to answer the question. Mm -hmm. Right. So you want to establish, you understand the question. Yeah. Right. You understand, um, you understand what this question is driving at. And then you want to explain why the limits of your knowledge exist. Right. Uh, but in and in doing that, right, in doing that, you'll also expose the limits of the alternative position, right? What they don't know either. What they don't know as well. Like yeah, nobody yeah. knows this thing that would need to be answered in order for me to respond to this question. And so what they're saying is also as unsubstantiated. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, and, and, and I think a lot of kids have been put in that situation where they've been told their whole life they need to be skeptical of everything that comes out of a Catholic's mouth or everything that's they're They're, they're really trained to, at the very best, approach Catholicism with skepticism. However, they've they're told Catholicism or that's that that same kind of skepticism. They should not approach what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right? right the the skepticism belongs on the catholic church but it doesn't belong on the secular culture that's telling you to approach everything religious with this idea of skepticism right right so so actually yeah it's a way of illustrating good this is a clear way to illustrate this right so um you know you've probably seen some youtube videos of of a creationist right approaching approaching uh various Darwinistic atheists, right? Mm -hmm. About evolution and leaving aside, um, you know, whether you think evolution and, and creation and, uh, are, are reconcilable concepts, right? Let's just, let's just deal with the basic challenge. The, the atheist believes that the whole notion of creation is nonsense, that mm -hmm. there is no God and there's no, there's no sort of design in the universe, but he's totally convinced uh, of his view that mm -hmm. through through impersonal uh, forces and random mutation, the world has taken the shape that it has. And so the, the creationist comes up to him and confronts him with a basic question, right? Yeah. And he says, well, have you ever, can you give me a single example, right? So we're talking about the scientific method. Observation experimentation, repetition. Yeah. Can you give me a single example of when we've had the scientific method applied uh, to document evolution from one sort of kind of thing to another? Yeah, one species to another. Yeah, so, yeah. so even... So actually, this is this is actually very interesting because of the way that scientists today, biologists today, um, use the term species, which is which is really sort of um, a, a not clearly defined term, right? Yeah. You, you actually you actually want to push even further. You want to push to genus, genus. essentially, right? 
uh, you this is this is actually I just I recently I recently figured this out. Um, you want to push to genus because they'll say you know one species of sparrow and another species of sparrow. Oh sure, yeah. Right? yeah. You know what I mean? And you're like, well, I don't know. I mean, like, I think they're still the same bird. Yeah. But <laughs> you see what I mean? But but when you push them to genus, you know, like a salamander becoming something that isn't a salamander. Yeah. Of course they can't, there is no, not a single example, right? Where that's ever happened. Uh, there's not a single example of a bacterium, right? And, and where you could show mutations that resulted it, in it not being a bacterium. Right. Uh, you, uh, there's and, nothing, and like, yeah. I'm not even saying that evolution, in saying this, I'm personally not saying that I, that evolution is, false i'm not saying this demonstrates the falsehood of evolution what i'm what i think the issue is is that what it does demonstrate is that evolution is itself not subjected to the scientific method and therefore uh can't can't really claim like you gotta you gotta you, you gotta sort of play in the same field right if you're gonna yeah if yep. you're gonna come at theological claims and say that they're not you can't substantiate them scientifically. So like, I don't believe them. Why are you so dogmatically um, attached to the theory of evolution? I, I want to know yeah. that because like, you don't have, you can't subject it to the kind of scrutiny that you're demanding for my theological claims when I'm making theological claims. And I never said they could be subjected to that kind of analysis, <laughs> right? That's yeah. not the claim I'm making. That's, that's yeah. your demand, right? So at least be consistent. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that what that what that does for the adolescents, because I've had that conversation before with uh, um, uh, a particular uh, uh, young kid, uh, very smart kid. Um, but he had that hang up. Right. Um, one of the things I think that, you know, again, you're 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 helping them think through these issues uh, uh, from uh, um, an an honest. Right. So you're, you're not saying um, I'm going to you know, crush your argument. No, I'm just going to point out an inconsistency in it. You know, you're showing some humility, right? So you're saying, here's, while I'm saying this, here's what I'm not saying, right? There's, you know, there's, there is, you know, humility in that, right? Um, here's what I don't know, right? Again, that's, you know, showing humility within there. So, I mean, I think this is this, whether, whether it be this issue or many others, you know, to help them, process this and think deeply about these things um i think is is just absolutely key and we have yeah. to be able to to approach it again from the objective and the subjective um but i think like you said you know it does you know a lot of times while we can offer them questions and stuff until it really comes from them it's going to be very difficult to i i think reach them i think that's uh i think that's uh spot on um uh, any final any final thoughts? With, yeah, so I think you know that. that what, so one of the things I, was, I think I was getting at, right, and talking about the whole evolutionary thing, is that that you have uh, a need, I think, as a in catechesis or evangelization of the youth or whatever, to turn the critical lens mm -hmm. out to the world. Yeah. Now I don't mean to deflect it from you, right? I I, I think if they want to have a critical they have actual questions. They have real doubts. Sure. They're not actually persuaded. And so you have a certain obligation to show your position as coherent, right? Uh, you don't need to accept the burden of responsibility to demonstrate that, uh, that it's true. Right. Right. What you, this is going back to, you know, the middle ages to the time of the scholastics who recognized that you can raise you can answer objections, right, uh, without necessarily assuming the responsibility to demonstrate the veracity of your position. Right. Right. You can show that the objection doesn't take your position down. And, and so what you do is you turn, you, you accept there's a critical lens cast in your direction, mm -hmm. but you point out, look behind you. There's a whole... What about all of that? Don't you see any of that through a critical lens? Yeah. You teach them to do that. And that's what opens up 
the possibility that they might they might accept this line of this line of reasoning, right? That that um, there there are limits to human knowledge and human understanding. There are sort of um, blind spots, even in even in Revelation. There, God doesn't reveal everything to us. Right. He only reveals those things that we need to know for the sake of our salvation, right? But um, but there are questions he just doesn't answer. The Job in the in the whirlwind, right? I mean, think <laughs> this is that's the point of God questioning Job in the in the whirlwind. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When I made the behemoth? When I made the, where were you? I didn't I didn't see you there. I didn't think so. <laughs> Why are you? You wouldn't even understand the answers if I gave them to you. That's God's answer to Job, right? Yeah. So, um, so no, there are going to be questions that we can't answer. There are going to be things we just don't know. Um, all right. And, and anybody who's been paying attention to the theological dialogue since the Middle Ages recognizes that some really big questions are just not answerable. Right. Yeah. The whole thing about predestination and and future contingency is you can have opinions on that, right? But like there's no actual definitive answer to this question. It's a it's a problem. It's a big, big question mark. Yeah. So um the question then is in the end, what worldview is more coherent? Which yeah. one actually um, hangs together the best, has the most explanatory power, and leaves me in a world that that I can live in. That that's an important those are important questions, right? And maybe that's as far as we can we can get at this time. Yeah. And I think I think you're 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 spot on um, that and especially as the chasm between the world and the church gets bigger and bigger. Um, and the 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 witness of the the Christian um, can start to become looking more like martyrdom than um, you know brilliant preachers. Um, I think it's important for the uh, uh, for the, the 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 teacher the mentor who's in this position, um, you know, to you know, like Saint Paul says, you know, stand fast, right, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on those things that you've been given, right. Um, but also, but also learn learn the person in front of you, right. Um, don't just say they're mistaken or they're stupid teenagers or something like that. No, take them seriously. Um, that's, a, that's an act of love. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and also remember, you know, the other words of St. Paul, right. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. We, we, we constantly, you know, the eighth grader who's accepted faith, that doesn't mean he's going to have faith next week. That doesn't mean he's going to have faith when he's in high school. Right. That there has to be this. And again, I think this is what the church means by accompaniment. There has to be this um, this constant voice, uh, even though it might be quiet, like we said in the beginning, um, it's steady. It's, um, it's, it's always there, uh, no matter how loud uh, the world is yelling at them. Uh, and so I want to invite all our listeners. Uh, thanks for joining us. I hope there's uh, a lot to think about here. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have any suggestions or you have any further thoughts, please drop them in the comments below. And we'll do our best to respond. Uh, this is such a huge topic. Um, but it's it, but because uh, the salvation of souls is at um, is at stake, it's important for us to to think these things through, to 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 really uh, uh, don't set them aside. Um, um, so I want to invite all our listeners um, check out all of our content over at CatholicStudiesAcademy.com, and I just want to uh, also say that uh, Dr. Bruce Kelly is having a uh, seminar on uh, Mary uh, coming up next week. Uh, be sure to sign up for that over at catholicstudiesacademy.com. Till next time, God bless.